tonight, Eric Hess. Eric received his Master's of Fine Arts with a concentration in glass and sculpture from the University of Texas in Arlington. He is the winner of a 2018 International Stanislav Lubinsky Award and has received scholarships from Pilchett Glass School, Penland School of Craft, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, and received a visionary scholarship from the Art Alliance for Contemporary Art. He completed an artist in residency with the Washington School of Glass and assisted glass artist Tim Tate. His work has shown in exhibitions at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, Prague Gallery of Glass in Czechoslovakia, National Liberty Museum in Philadelphia, the New Orleans Museum of Art, Nave Museum in Victoria, Texas, and at various exhibitions in New Orleans, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, and Philadelphia. So we are so lucky to have him in Shreveport and here at the Meadows. Eric taught sculpture and sandcasted glass at the University of Texas at Arlington, and he has been invited to compete, complete an artist in residency with glass artist Sylvia Levinson in Italy. He curated the Texas Contemporary Glass Exhibition at the Nave Museum in Victoria, Texas, and at Art Space in Shreveport, Louisiana, and curated several exhibitions throughout the Gulf South. Eric presently lives here in Shreveport, Louisiana. He is the CEO and Creative Director of Sanctuary Art Studio and Art School and Glass Studio, which recently purchased the Benet Zion Temple Building, which will be the new home of Sanctuary Art, Art Center. So please join me in welcoming Eric Hess. Okay, so I'm probably going to go fast because whenever I'm sitting in the audience, I'm like, oh my God, they're going on and on. And I need nibbly bits to eat. Uh, so anyway, let me, let me kind of go through this. Wasn't I cute? <laughs> <laughs> so this is me, 1962, in New Orleans, Louisiana. So I was born there, and it's uh, my favorite place on earth. So this was my family. I always try to figure out why I'm a little kooky. And it's because, um, you know, I had a lot of dysfunction in my family. My mother was a wonderful Italian woman from Sicily, but she was a seamstress. And she would dress me up as the worst characters for Mardi Gras. So, you know, can you see the feather in my hat? I mean, no wonder I'm gay. Look at the outfit. Hello. <laughs> and then I was like the cowardly lion, right? And then I was the devil. And then I was a firecracker. And my parents were all like Abe Lincoln and all those characters. And I was afraid someone was going to light me up and I'd explode. And then this is Humpty Dumpty. So of course, I'd get a crack in the head. So of course, you know, I had all of these uh, uh, kind of experiences. And uh, what was interesting, both of my parents were depression baby so they never we never traveled never went to restaurants never went to movies church was the only place we went so i have a lot of background with church new orleans that's where i'm from so i was there for 51 years i love it i'm just enthralled by the entire thing uh, the cemeteries i think are incredibly beautiful and i'm going to refer back to those soon but it is just a magical place. It's like a Europe in America. So I go back often. I still have friends there. So in my early years, I owned a, the state's fourth largest advertising firm called Hess Marketing, mainly because I loved doing art, but my father was like, he was abusive, and we'll get into all that. But he was like, you have to do something making money. You know, you'll never make money with art. So I owned that, I was director of the ballet, and before that I was a ballet dancer. So that's me as the snow and nutcracker, snow prince. And I was a reporter at Channel 8, and I covered the political beat, so that was back during David Duke and Edwin Edwards, which was crazy. And I worked, I ran the amphitheater at the World's Fair. So I've had all these different jobs because I have ADD and I'm hopping around and trying to do a thousand things at one time. And um, I've been on 12 different nonprofit boards, and uh, Le Petit Theater was one of my favorites. So I love theater. And we were the official ballet of the opera. So this is my family in Shreveport. So I have 10 grandchildren, which is insane. I can't have them all together at one time. They drive me crazy. 
This is my husband, Frank, uh, Judge Frank Thaxton, and he has terminal cancer, and we're gonna get into that with one of the works that I have, and these are the four kids, the main kids. So we've been together 20 years. So in the beginning, photography was kind of my thing, mainly because I really didn't have access to studios with glass and pottery and those types of things. So uh, for me, photography, but I was fascinated by windows and reflection. So here we go, my introduction into glass. So whenever I did my travels, I would try to find windows everywhere and try to reflect. So for example, they always had to have some sort of meaning to me. I really wanted to say something other than possibly it being beautiful or interesting. So for example, you see all the trees in the reflection, but the gears. So that whole, and you'll see the piece upstairs with the leaves and the hanging from the kind of gears, that, that whole kind of issue of how technology and business controls our environment and destroys it. Um, so this is a, a piece that was a window in New York City, uh, and you can sort of see the reflection of this kind of skyscraper uh, over this uh, beautifully adorned woman. And really I wanted to kind of address uh, the control of business over women and that women really couldn't get a whole ahead in business and were uh, seen differently than men. Uh, this was a reflection in a hotel in so this is not photoshopped or anything. This is a direct picture. I don't like to photoshop. And this was uh, uh, a video that was playing on a column and uh, there was a piece of glass and then this was the hotel. So all of these kind of lights that you see were these images coming in and out on this uh, column in the hotel. And this was another piece in Vegas so this was a reflection on three panels of glass of the ceiling that was above, which I thought was beautiful. Then a good friend of mine, when I owned my ad agency and I collected glass, um, he said, I'm a sandcaster, he's a, and he's a sandcaster. I had never touched glass before, and he called me and he said, my assistant quit, can you come help ladle 2300 degree glass? And I said, no will not be doing that, don't want to get near it. And he goes, no, please, 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 I have all the gear for you. He overgeared me. I mean, I look like a space suit or something. So, um, so I just kind of fell in love with it, and I had 40 employees, I was a very large ad agency, and I was like, that's it. Sold my ad agency and just volunteered working with him. And these were the first thing I did, these were awards for Parkway Partners that uh, re planted trees all over the city, and I was on the board of this. Oh, can I take this off? I've been vaccinated, but it's hard to breathe, and I'm about six feet away. Um, so I, I learned how to do all of this. He taught me the process, and that was it for me. At that point, he said, well, why don't you go to Tulane University, which has a glass program, and just take a few classes? Well, that wasn't enough, and I got another bachelor's degree in glass. So at that point, I'm just thinking, I'm gonna make a few sculptures, sell them in local shops, and you know, maybe do that. And then professor came to me and said, thank God for professors, right? So they're very important, and people that inspire you and help you along. And he said, why don't you enter some of your pieces in these competitions, and I started winning things and uh, started selling a lot of art, and he said, why don't you get your master's degree? And I was like, well, why do I need that? I said, I've been through a lot of school. I have three undergraduate degrees. And he said, um, well, you know, it'll position you better as an artist, easier to sell your work and get into better galleries. I said, well, as long as I can continue making artwork, I will do that. So I applied to three different colleges, got three full scholarships, and I chose the uh, so Frank and I were, I was in New Orleans and he was up here in Shreveport and we were going back and forth. He'd drive down one week and I'd drive down the next. And that was for 15 years, it was exhausting. But um, anyway, so I decided to go ahead and enter that program and, and that was a real turning point for me as an artist. So I really started developing these, uh, you see the, you'll see this one that's upstairs, called Redemption. A lot of the pieces really deal with 
uh, things that have touched me through life, religion, the opera, this one's called Bohem. You can kind of see that imagery of the snow. Uh, this is a sandblasted, sandcasted piece. So I started doing these sculptures. Uh, this one is uh, called um, uh, The Voyage. And this is, uh, you can sort of see the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Some people will pick up on it, some won't. And this is actually from a car. So any of you car people can see the see that. Um, this is called um, Sanctuary and actually kind of mimics a stained glass piece. So I really wanted this to kind of give you that image of walking into the sanctuary of a church, but it's kind of open and exposed and it really kind of reminded me of those churches that were bombed during many of the wars, especially World War II. And uh, this piece also has the X's from Katrina. This was the Katrina series. So my house flooded, it was awful. So I went through all of that. So all of my work really is about uh, my life experiences. And my hope is that when people see the artwork that they will draw from it on their own life experiences. This is called Resurrection. There again, a religious theme. Um, and I do a lot of things about, I feel badly about how we as human treat nature and how we're destroying our planet. And this is called Relic. And you sort of see the Christ figure once again, all sandcasted uh, pieces. Then this is huge. It's this big. It's really big. So I, this came off of a bank vault. And then what I did was I drilled holes through the glasses and I did copper inclusions and then added the birds on top. And on the back, if you pour glass onto very uh, small frit paper, it causes embossments, and that's what the tree is. And then here we have that kind of angel figure. So this was a whole series I did uh, mimicking very large books. So then um, I learned blown glass, and I'll tell you why I did that. I was, you become overwhelmed as an artist many times in developing work that is meaningful, and sometimes you just wanna play, right? and you want to have fun. So for me, I really wanted my glass to not look like anybody else and have this painterly quality to it. So what I would do is uh, painstakingly add a lot of marinis and frit and pulled cane and arrange it, and then uh, I would heat it in a kiln, and then I would roll it up and then blow it out. So this series right here is being sold at the National Liberty Museum. Um, and. Uh, it sells really fast, so I'm happy about that. It creates a little bit of money, because I work for free at Sanctuary Glass Studio. And then I did a kiln cast uh, process with the lost wax process in clay, um, and that's basically developing this in clay. This was, uh, both of these were done in clay. Then I poured plaster silica on top of it, and then I would uh, take a, uh, what's the thing on your teeth? that pushes water at you, a pick, water pick. And I knock all of that out, which created the negative, and then laid it down and piled the white glass into it. So this really was about they're getting back to nature and wanting to, you know, anemones and barnacles. So really I did this whole series uh, dealing with, you know, kind of honoring that, but it was all done in white because I, I wanted to show the beauty of it, but also the issue of when coral dies, it kind of gets bleached. So I wanted people to kind of think about that. Then I did the icon series, which is, these are uh, uh, five Virgin Marys. And most people may come up to it and think, you know, that's really beautiful, I wanna buy that without really thinking deep into it. So of course, this symbolizes the five major uh, religious wars. And I really wanted to bring to issue, because I studied to be a Jesuit priest, and I really wanted to bring to issue how religion is used to you know, cause harm in this world. And this one is a pope on the hot and cold. This one was just purchased by the Museum of Glass in Tacoma for their permanent collection. So the pope doesn't have any face and he doesn't have any hands. And so uh, this was the last pope, and so the issue was it's hot and cold issues. He was like, women are very important to the church, but they can't be priests or 
you know, we love your gay neighbors, but it's an abomination. So he was kind of going back and forth. The minute he kind of started making you feel about Catholicism again and feeling good, he would just jump back and, and say something really bad. So that's what that piece, uh, and I used an antique uh, water faucet, which I think is beautiful. And this is where everything changed. This is when I really started getting recognition and the museum started recognizing me around the world and calling me and talking to me. So this was a piece called Soul. Uh, this is hot casted. Uh, it almost looks like a flame. And then this is an internal piece and this is a secondary piece. So when you mix hot and cold water together, um, so if you put cold water in this and warm water in this, it forms these little tiny bubbles and it's lit from underneath. So what happens is the bubbles begin to transition. So the piece really uh, was talking about, you know, how our souls transitioned and how that, how we can change over time and become better people. Um, and so this piece actually um, uh, was at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And then it got some recognition. And then this is the one that won the, it's sort of like the Oscars in the glass community. It's called the Stanislav Lubinsky Award. So what I did was I embedded a, a hot sculpted uh, fetus that was sandblasted in ice. And there's no support in the bottom. You can see these two bars here. So this would hang in the middle of a room with one uh, barn door square light going through it. And that's all it was. And people would walk into the room and they would think, oh, how beautiful. They would think it's all glass. And they would, the closer they would get, they would start hearing the dripping. So it's like tears, right? And then they would feel the coolness coming off of the ice. And then they would look close and they would recognize this is gonna melt and this little fetus is gonna to crash to the ground. So then the anxiety begins to build for the individuals. So let me tell you, to set this up in Prague with the you know, with the ice people there was extremely difficult. So I had to hire an interpreter over there and actually go through the city because you, you have to push lots of oxygen through ice to get all the impurities out to get it this clear. So we had to uh, basically teach this ice sculptor there how to do it. So this eventually falls to the ground and it shatters. And then uh, in the exhibition after that, a video is shown so people can see the process, but they just see the broken fetus on the ground. So I was dealing with Frank having terminal cancer, this was five years ago. So I was really dealing with issues of um, how fragile life is, right? Because we kind of go through life, even as young people, you know, and everything's wonderful. And some people, even young, have experienced death in their families or friends. But I really wanted to deal with the issue of the anxiety that is caused by the waiting for someone to die. And it's just an awful thing. Okay. So that's in the room. So it's just this really kind of beautiful experience when you first walk in to kind of see that floating above. Then this piece, having a father that was abusive, um, this piece is a two by two and then 42 inches. So it's the length of my father's belt, which was his, uh, what he used. And so you can see the buckle coming out of the front. And so shadows are very important to me in my new work. And you sort of see, you know the old time coffins? So it was somewhat of a memorial uh, to my father. But you know, we encase that belt, it can't do any more harm. Um, but what I loved about this piece when I was a professor at UTA, I would bring my students in, I wouldn't tell them it was my work. And they'd all sit around the wall and I would talk to them about what do you see and so on and so forth. And you know, one young lady said, oh, I've been fighting, uh, you know, gaining weight all my life. And she goes, this is so meaningful to me. She goes, it kind of puts an end to that. You know, that's not why I created, but that's what I love about conceptual art is that it allows people to, because of their own life experiences, to bring that to a work and draw from that. So I had all different types of, some people just saw it as an older man dying and that it was just kind of a memorial. And most people got it 
I mean, this one lady came. She was probably in her 30s, and she had an abusive father. And she went up to the wall, and the minute she read the name Exhale, she got it and just started crying. And, um, but that was the whole issue, that it's, you want it to stop, right, as a child? And that was the whole issue of, if I embed that in, in the cement, it cannot be used any longer. So there's the buckle. And it's actually his, his uh, belt. So this piece is called encroachment. It is upstairs. So because I can't afford real diamonds, which would be nice, um, these are faux diamonds with shards of glass. And then this is a cage that I welded. I love to weld. It's so much fun. Uh, that is there. Uh, so basically, you'll see that visually your eye can pick up that if you pick this cage up, it could land on there. So there again, we're dealing with shadows. So you can see, to me, this kind of symbolized for me the windows on downtown office buildings and things like that. But it's also a cage, an entrapment. So our desire to uh, control wealth, to get wealth, um, in will encage us. So that's what that, that ominous shadow that is moving towards that. And I think you had a student that saw something, which is great. She saw it as the faux diamonds and really uh, looked at it that way. And that's what I love is that people can come away with different interpretations of my work. So this, you can kind of see the, the dramatic shadow. OK, so this is Swings. Um, so this piece just came down at an exhibition at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, and there again, people had different uh, interpretations. Some people that had lost kids or their children ran away from home, mainly because we associate Swings with children. And I associate it also with the playfulness and the youth of us, even as older people. And you can see there again, the shadow was very important. This looks like the chemo bag that hangs above the patient. Um, not a lot of people will get that, but some people might think about it. So this was really my journey with Frank. And you know, I'm basically the, the swing that's together and his is broken. It's not totally broken. You always have that hope that person is gonna be cured and that swing will be put back together. It's probably too simple, but um, Anyway, and this probably will be going to England soon uh, in that piece. So there's that reflection. So this piece was in my uh, MFA exhibition. So basically, I sculpted a full-size human in a fetal position, and I placed him under this fabric in the room. And what I did was I took the I forgot what you call this, but I put that over the fabric so it created this tension and people would take their shoes off and walk in the room. So if you're around the edge, the piece didn't really move that much, but if you came a little bit closer, it starts to rock and then you're like, most people would jump back because they don't want to destroy or hurt the sculpture. But basically what I wanted people to do is when in, when you're in a fetal position, you're having a sphere or, you know, depression or you're basically in a state of not being happy. And different people in your lives will approach you differently. Some people are, you know, they always have that saying that you'll be so surprised when you're having really bad times in life, you'll be surprised by the people that come to help you or be near you. And other people, they don't know how to deal with it and they step away. So that's what this was about. I wanted people to really kind of feel that uncomfortableness of approaching someone that is having that kind of uh, despair and that you can have a sense of a relationship with a person. And then some people really got really close up like this and they kind of touched and everything, which I really loved. So that's what that piece was about. And luckily it made it through the exhibition without the fabric tearing. That was my biggest scare. Okay, so this is upstairs. It's usually about 10 feet tall when it takes me about two weeks to construct these. Uh, I did it pretty fast because uh, I had parts pre-done. So this is called Mother and this is spun steel. And I love working with steel also. 
Um, have y'all all been upstairs? Every, okay, great. So basically, uh, it's really kind of beautiful, kind of when you're far apart, and it looks kind of like a wig or hair. And, you know, like my mother and many other mothers, you know, they endure, they take care of the family. I come from a different generation where my mother was uh, at home. She was a seamstress for a while, but she, when we were all born, she took care of us and stayed home. And I used to volunteer in the housing developments in New Orleans when I was studying to be a Jesuit priest. And I noticed that it was the women that kept the families together and were the strength in the family. So even though it's kind of beautiful and it reminds you of kind of gray hair and older woman, which my mother is now, it's that sense of steel is strong, right? So there's a sense of maybe fragility, but there's a sense that there is strength in mothers. Uh, that we depend on and that we love. Um, so that's what that work is about. Okay, so this piece, let me see if I can get it going. Oh, I guess it's not gonna play. Anyway, y'all probably saw it. So this is uh, what I did, this was a painstakingly difficult piece to make. Uh, Cause first you have to videotape um, a whole 24-hour um, period of the ocean, right? And then what I did was I edited one frame behind the other because I wanted this kind of um, uh, static kind of feel to create a little bit of discomfort that this isn't really beautiful, that life isn't totally beautiful, that there is a static in life and there's gonna be bad times. But it's there again, it's kind of the symbol of a lifetime, right? You know, from morning to dusk, and then life begins again for another. So this process, and I wanted that distortion because life isn't always clear and perfect. We have to, you know, realize that there are distorted views, especially now with social media, what to believe, what not to believe. And, um, and there again, I'm bringing in nature once again. Uh, into the work. Oh, of course now it's running, right? Okay, so this piece I'm working on, uh, there's gonna be 14 bowls, it's called Ripple, and they're about this big. It's gonna take up a room about this size, maybe a little bit smaller. They're about this big, it's blown glass, and I can blow rondelles about this big, and then we sand cast the back, and it creates almost like a screen. And then from above, I project a single drop of water, which you can see there. And what happens is the ripples come up the side and then they reflect on the people in the room and the walls. And the ripples are in different speeds. And just like us as human beings, there are some people that make sudden impacts, right? and it's very uh, impactful to us, and it affects us very immediately. And then there are others where the ripple's very slow, and individuals affect other people and affect our communities in a way uh, that is more long-lasting and over a longer period of time. So I wanted people to roam around these and amongst them so that they became part of that and part of the experience, and therefore, that is why this piece is um, the Tate Museum. I don't know if y'all know it. It's in, uh, they have an interest in this, so they want to kind of see it once I get it together. This is a video. I wish I could get these to work. There we go. So I'm really bad at vid videotaping my own work. So anyway, it, you can sort of, you'll be able to see the ripple, and it goes up the side. So we all impact other people and impact our environment, impact basically everything with who we are and what lives we touch. So I really wanted this piece to really talk about that. Okay, what am I doing now? Okay, so I am the uh, CEO and creative director of Sanctuary Glass Studio. If y'all wanna come, I give discounts to students. Uh, but we do create your own. You can do like one of 11 items. It's simple stuff, but it's fun. It's fun to feel the glass and touch the glass and be involved with it. And, um, 
and I'm showing in a lot of different museums and places. We did buy the temple downtown, which we're gonna turn into a community arts center, and that's going to have what we call the clean arts, because the arts council is gonna do the dirty arts in their our maker space. So we're gonna be doing uh, glass, painting, uh, drawing, clay, um, yeah, I think that's most of them. And, um, and I think that might be it. Yeah, that's it. So I'll answer any questions. Let me just turn this off. So I have a lot of other pieces that I'm, I'm working on for Habitat Gallery, which is the biggest uh, uh, glass gallery. And they go to Sofa and all these places to sell art. So th that's going to be a series of uh, glass pieces. So I'll be glad to answer any questions that you guys have. Yes. So um, a lot of your work, of course, doesn't have to be installed, right? And so I'm curious if all the pieces that require installation, do you always travel with them, or do you just leave? Sometimes you do, and then sometimes you just give your kid a proper showing, like the swings. You were talking about sending those. Right. Um, so the, I did. I sent them to the Museum of Glass, and I gave them a diagram. Um, how far apart they needed, how far apart the seats needed to be. Um, the length of the change could be adjusted according to their ceiling height. So that one was really easy. The metal one, I have to go. The hair, I have to do it. It just, you know, because it, it's uh, created every time I do it. It's not as if I have it in a box and they can put it on the wall, unfortunately. I had a commission to do one for someone's house, and it, as long as it remains, in one space, it's, it's fine. But moving it from museum to museum is very difficult to do. Um, yeah, all the new video, they're gonna be much larger formats about this size, because um, I want it to be more impactful. That was kind of the first one I did, just to see about the reflection. It, it's called cane, uh, the glass in the, ca in the case. Um, and the, the piece with the cage and the faux diamonds, very easy to, for them to install that. Um, yeah, so it just depends on, I mean, I went to Prague to do the fetus because it was complicated to do, and I had to, meet, I had to go a week ahead of time because of the issue with getting the ice the right way and develop. And that's a very di difficult piece to show because um, uh, it's, it's great if you have cement floors, but the staff has to constantly wipe the floor because I really don't, visually don't want like a big giant tub or something there. So people, they have to constantly, uh, it's maintenance heavy piece, but it's, it's beautiful when it's up and when it, and when it works. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go if, uh, I may be, be going to Tacoma, I'm not looking, I mean to, um, Japan, but I'm not looking forward to flying there. I have a thing with planes and elevators and enclosures and stuff like that. So, any other questions? I have a question. Yes. No, so um, you can make your own glass. Um, it's just very difficult uh, in order for glass artists to, first of all, to have the clarity in the glass and for the glass to stay hot a very long time. Uh, the formula has to be very specific in there. I get my glass from Czechoslovakia. It really is the best glass. It's called Kugler. And um, so it's really best if we just kind of um, order it. Now, one thing, and I didn't picture it on here, but we have, I blow, uh, glass into sand, and I will use sand from like Louisiana, and I'm, I'm working on this new series that actually will incorporate um, imagery, because I'm really concerned about what's happening with the delta down there and the loss of, you know, habitat. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is take um, uh, the Im images of all the plant life and things like that and incorporate it into my pieces, but then blowing into uh, the soil actually going out because our furnace is on wheels and I can put it on propane so I can blow anywhere 
So I'm thinking of actually hauling it out and blowing it into the mud and things in, in those areas to create uh, kind of these standalone kind of bases and pieces like that. So, you know, it, it just depends on how the work kind of evolves. I'm doing another piece. You all know an hourglass, right? So I'm just blowing the top of an hourglass with the opening. So the bottom's gone and it hangs singularly in the middle of the room and it's gonna have ashes in it from trees and things that are burned. And uh, basically the little cork comes out during the opening and it's gonna take about a week for that to create a pile. And really, you know, talking about the loss of habitat and things. And I was gonna have another one that's gonna be like faux ashes for human beings. And, our relationships, you have one life, you have one environment. So uh, I'm going to address those kind of issues with that piece. Anybody else? Well, thank Oh, yeah, go ahead. What was the scariest career change for you? What was what? The scariest career change. Oh, my God. Um, I think selling my ad agency, because it was very successful. I made a ton of money. I had FEMA, the Ritz-Carlton, the top law firms in the city. I, you know, I had 40 employees. You also go from, there's a social aspect. I love being around people. That's why I love getting my MFA, because I was around all these brilliant artists and people. And, um, but yeah, I mean, think about it. You're giving up tons of money, a successful company. I sold the company. Uh, to all of a sudden become an artist. You know, oh my God. Uh, but luckily I had a husband who, you know, was successful. He retired as a judge, but continued doing mediations and arbitrations. Uh, so, you know, that was, but still I wanted to be successful on my own and be independent. So that was the hardest. I, I didn't have a problem leaving the TV station. There was tons of egos there. And those people were just, backstabbers and crazy was kind of the ballet was uh, I love the ballet and love producing theater and doing that kind of stuff so I miss that but I knew that physically it was if I kept doing it it was going to be really bad in the future you get horrible arthritis now I wasn't on point like the girls which I feel so bad for them because they have all kind of issues with their feet when they get older and ankles um, but I kind of miss the creative aspect. So my pieces, which was really interesting, because um, I was always fascinated by lighting in theater, and that kind of influenced all my pieces with the shadows, and I could see how light could change these horrible looking sets to look magnificent. So that really kind of is part of the influence, because uh, when I came here, she will tell you, I ran over to the art department and I said, I need a barn door light for the encroachment piece. <laughs> so and they gave me the barn door light um, because I knew, knew that, I knew what it is. So my, my suggestion for, how many of you are actually gonna be artists or are y'all taking these as adjunct courses? Artists, artists. So my suggestion is, um, you know, really work with your community. The, um, a lot of the, my success wasn't that I was just this magnificent artist. It's just I worked with other artists in the community that had connections, that knew this person or that person, or once they knew me, they got me into exhibitions. So that kind of sense of community in the art world is so very important uh, to kind of make those connections and to get your art. Don't feel bad about asking a friend and say, oh my God, you're." You know, you're coming up in the biennial in Venice. How do you get into that? You know, and most people are very generous and they're gonna to wanna to help you in the future. And that's very, and, and we're still in the planning, but uh, the plan is to create a glass program here at Centenary uh, and uh, for me to teach here with uh, our other glass blower and to add glass as a, uh, as a, uh, a form of artwork that students can work with. But y'all should come down to Sanctuary. Uh, how many are painters? How many people are painting? So you can take high-fired enamels and paint that on just 96 CE, COE glass, and then we can take it and roll it up and blow it out to a three-dimensional item for you. 
So, you know, glass is, what I love about glass is you can see through it, right? It has all these reflective qualities. It can be very beautiful. You can sand cast and get this very textural, rough uh, surface. So to me, glass is uh, a beautiful medium to work with. It can be very dangerous. Um, it just depends on what area. If you're doing kiln casting, that's pretty safe. Uh, sand casting can be dangerous uh, in the hot shop. If you're constantly breathing in those fumes, and it can be bad for your eyes. Many glass blowers who don't use the proper eye protections have to have surgeries on their eyes as they get older. Um, but it is a beautiful uh, medium to work with, um, which is nice. Anything else? I really want to thank you guys and thank Centenary and thank Alyssa and her staff. So thank you. <laughs>